Over the past few years, most central bank governors have woken up in the morning and said, I wonder what the rich industry of life will offer today. And no one has felt that more keenly than our next speaker, Mario Draghi, the President of the European Central Bank. Well, my thanks to Laura Green and to uh, Mervyn for the honor of this invitation and the pleasure to be with you today. I, while I was trying to prepare for this conversation, I asked myself what sort of uh, message do I want to uh, give to you. I wouldn't, word, I wouldn't use the word sell, but actually I, I think the best thing I could do is to give you a, a candid assessment of how uh, we view the Euro situation from Frankfurt. And uh, the first thing that came to mind was um, something that people said uh, many years ago and then stopped saying it. That the euro is like a bumblebee, uh, which is a mystery in nature because uh, it shouldn't fly, and, it, and it, instead it does. So the euro was a bumblebee that flew very well for several years. And now, I think uh, uh, people asked, how come? Probably there was something in the atmosphere, in the, in the air, that made the bumblebee fly. Now something must have changed in the air, and we know what, after the financial crisis. So the bumblebee will have to graduate into a real bee. And that's what it's doing. So um, the first message I, I would like to send is that the, uh, this uh, euro is actually much, much stronger. The euro area is much, much stronger than people acknowledge today. Uh, oh, not only if you look over the last 10 years, but also if you look at, na look at it now, you see that uh, as far as inflation, employment, productivity, uh, the Euro era has done either like or better than the US and Japan. Then the comparison becomes even more dramatic when we come to deficit and debt. The Euro era is much lower deficit, much lower debt than these two countries. And um, also, not, uh, not less, less important, uh, uh, it has a complete, it's a balanced current account, no, uh, no deficits, but also it has a degree of social cohesion that you wouldn't find either in, in, in the other two countries. So, and, uh, and that's a very important uh, ingredient for undertaking all the structural reforms that will actually graduate the bubble B into a real B. The second point, uh, the second message that I'd like to send you today is that progress has been extraordinary in the last six months. If you compare today Euro area, Euro member states with six months ago, you would see that the world is entirely different today and for the better. And this progress has taken different shapes at national level, because of course, while I was saying, while I was glorifying the merits of the Euro, you were thinking, but that's an average. And in fact, countries diverge so much within the Euro area that averages are not representative any longer when the variance is so big. But I would say that over the last six months, this average tended to, well, the variance tend to decrease and countries tend to converge much more than they did, they had done in many years. Both at national level, like in countries like the country progress, like Portugal, Ireland, and the countries that are not in the program, like Spain and Italy, the progress in undertaking uh, deficit control, structural reforms, has been, has been uh, everything but remarkable. And uh, they'll have to continue doing so, of course. But the pace has been set, and uh, all, the, all the signals that we get is that uh, they don't, uh, they don't uh, relent, they don't stop reforming themselves. It's a complex process because for many years, very little was done. We'll come, we'll come to this in a moment. But a lot of progress has been done at supranational level. That's why I always say that the last summit was a real success. The last summit was a real success because the first time in many years that all the leaders of the 27 countries of Europe, including the UK, so, said that the only way to out of this present crisis is to have more Europe. 
a Europe that is founded on four building blocks, fiscal union, a banking union, a financial union, and an economic union. This, these blocks, in two words, we can continue discussing this later, but in two words means that, um, that much more of what is national sovereignty is going to be exercised at supranational level. That common fiscal rules will bind government's action on the fiscal side. That in the banking union or a financial markets union, which way one wants to call it, we will have a one supervisor for the whole euro area. And to show that there is full determination to move ahead, and these are not just empty words, this, uh, the Commission, the European Commission, will present a proposal for the one supervisor in early September, so in a month. And uh, we can say that, I, and I think. Uh, I can say that words are quite advanced and, uh, in, in, this, in this direction. So more Europe, but also the various firewalls have been given attention and now they are ready to work much better than, uh, than in the past. So the second message is that there is more progress than it's been acknowledged. But the third point I want to make is in a sense more political. Uh, when people talk about the fragility of the euro and the increasing fragility of the euro and perhaps the crisis of the euro, very often no new euro area member states or leaders underestimate the amount of political capital that's been invested in the euro. And so we view this and we are not, I don't think we are unbiased observers in Frankfurt, we think the euro is irreversible. And it's not an empty word now because I preceded saying exactly what actions we are making, have made, are making, will make it irreversible. There's another message that I want to tell you today, is that within our mandate, within our mandate, the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. And believe me, it will be enough. Uh, there are some short-term challenges, uh, to say the least. The short-term challenges, in, in our view, relate mostly to the uh, financial fragmentation that has taken place in the euro area. Investors retreated within their national boundaries. Uh, the interbank market is not functioning. It's functioning very little also within each country certainly not functioning across countries. Uh, and uh, we have to, to I think the key, uh, the key strategy point here is, if we want to get out of this crisis, we have to repair this financial fragmentation. And uh, there are two, uh, at least two dimensions to this. The interbank market is not functioning because for any bank in the world, the current liquidity regulation makes to lend to other banks or borrow from other banks a money-losing proposition. So the first reason is regulatory, uh, well, the, the first reason is uh, regulation that has to be recalibrated completely. The second point is, in a sense, is a collective action point. Because national supervisors, uh, looking at the crisis, have asked their banks, the banks under their supervision, to withdraw their activities within national boundaries. And they ring fence liquidity positions so liquidity can flow even across the same holding group. Because the supervisors, the banking supervisors, the financial sector supervisors say no. So even though each one of them may be right, collectively they've been wrong. And this situation will have to be overcome, of course. And then there is a risk aversion factor. Risk aversion has to do with counterparty risk. Now, to the extent that I think that my counterparty uh, is going to default, I'm not going to lend to this country. But it can be because it's uh, short of funding. And I think we took care of that with the two big LTROs operations where we injected uh, half a trillion of net liquidity in the euro area banks. We took care of that. Then you have uh, the counterparty risk is related to the perception that my counterparty can fail because of lack of capital. We can do little about that. Then there is another dimension to this that has to do with the premium that 
are being charged on sovereign states' borrowings. These premia have to, as I said, to do with default, with liquidity, but they also have to do more and more with convertibility, with the risk of convertibility. Now, to the extent that these premia have to do with, uh, not with, the, with, with factors inherent to my counterpart, they come into our mandate. They come within our remit. To the extent that the size of these sovereign premia hamper the functions of the, the functioning of the monetary policy transmission channels, they come within our mandate. So we'll have to cope with this financial fragmentation addressing these, uh, these issues. Um, I think uh, um, I, will, uh, I will stop here. I think uh, um,